Part 5, Section 2, The Mass Media Let me begin by quoting Malcolm X. The media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's power, because they control the minds of the masses. The mass media enhances and reinforces miseducation. For example, the recent case of the Mau Mau got snippets of media attention but we were nowhere near to being educated about the full horror of British concentration camps in Kenya, the genocide happening there. Adolf Hitler, he stopped material when the West wants to talk about atrocities. King Leopold of Belgium, well he's pretty much unknown. Let's take a look at the different ways in which the media does racism as white supremacy. The media gave us plenty of detail on the Hutu and Tutsi conflict, but nothing regarding the role of the West in pushing a stable class situation into war and then standing aside. Aaron Huey seems to be familiar with this, hence he says, the last chapter in any successful genocide is the one in which the oppressor can remove their hands and say, my god, what are these people doing to themselves? They're killing each other. They're killing themselves while we watch them die. The media monopolises the definition of racism, making it hard to connect to the reality with its subtleties and nuances. For example, giving thinly veiled extremists, like the EDL, airtime on panel shows or simply using them to present the overt, self-aware end of the spectrum. They're a distraction, a scapegoat even, preventing us from realising the institutional, ubiquitous, covert racism that's responsible for the stats we've seen in part one, and the miseducation we've just looked at. The argument on overt racism has been won. Justice is required. But with institutional racism in the police force and judicial system, what hope do we have? Another method emerges in audience participation and interviews. Serious discussions are often derailed by invalidations, logical fallacies, projection, denial, and so on. Some examples follow. Anti-racists, victims, and survivors will often face accusations of oversimplifying, overthinking, exaggeration, stirring up trouble, being anti-British. It's pretty obvious victim blaming when you know what to look for. And what happens when emotion enters the studio? There's a common tendency among white people to interpret any sign of emotion among minoritized people as weakness and irrational, even when faced with eugenicist assertions. This soon leads to white callers invalidating their opinions. By contrast, if white people show emotion when faced with charges of racism, they are seen by other white people as sincere. The stronger the display, the more convincing they become. So says David Gilborn. Einstein's diverse utterances remain powerful currency to this day. He was outspoken about racism. Did you know? Einstein's position on racism was, and still is, ignored by the mass media. Censorship in effect. So what did Einstein have to say on racism? Here's some content pulled from a speech that Einstein gave in 1946 to Lincoln University. He said, Racism is America's greatest disease. Racism is a disease of white people. And, there's a somber point in the social outlook of Americans. Their sense of equality and human dignity is mainly limited to men of white skins. Even amongst these, there are prejudices, of which I, as a Jew, am dearly conscious. But they're unimportant in comparison with the attitudes of whites towards their fellow citizens of darker complexion. I can escape the feeling of complicity in it only by speaking out. And their stereotypes and double standards. The mainstream media focuses on stories that feed or create fear, and also limited and or limiting acceptable roles. So some examples for stereotypes think crime and deviance, problems in the community, immigration, and for coerced acceptable roles, sport and entertainment. Here's some examples that are more subtle. Look out for them. Casting doubt on BMEs by using inverted commas or quotation marks, as in distraught parent with distraught in quotes, or using words to imply doubt in the same way, for example, alleged victim. There's also clustering of stories, for example, a story about using affirmative action to tackle unemployment placed next to a story of a crime committed by a BME person, or next to an illegal immigration story. And how about powerful associations? The Woolwich stabbing got saturation coverage. The word terrorism was always associated with it. That's example and repetition. A week earlier, Mohammed Salim was stabbed to death outside a mosque in Birmingham by a white man. Did you know? You had to read a lot of papers before you'd find it. 
and then it was far from the front page. Furthermore, the word terrorism was never used to describe the crime, even though the anti-terrorism squad did the forensic investigation. And what of Luis Suarez and John Terry? The media often remembers Suarez's crimes, but rarely Terry's. Terry's case went to court. There was sufficient evidence for that. Suarez's case didn't. Suarez got the lengthier FA ban. Persistence pays. What is example and repetition training for artificial neural networks is conditioning for the social engineering of people. An example then, and this is something common in the media at the moment. In times of austerity, when the dominant group is feeling the pinch, the media often blame and victimise immigrants, and by extension, all non-white people. This is done with accusations of taking jobs, being a drain on the state, criminality, etc. Remember how pattern recognition devices are trained? By example and repetition. Remember the vulnerability exposed by the friend, enemy, tank example? And so it's easy to see what Chris Jammy means when he says, seemingly minor yet persistent things penetrate the mind over time, making it difficult to ever realise the impact. Hence, the most dangerous forms of corruption are those that are subtle and below the radar. Malcolm X was also aware of it. This isn't the same quote that I read before. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. And then there's misleading remedies. In part one, I talked about the Gifted and Talented Initiative and mentioned colorblindness and that I'd return to it. This is when I return to it. It's time for a metaphor. The scenario is a marathon. At the lineup, some runners are forced to put stones in their shoes. The gun goes, and off they go. Partway through the race, the stones are removed. But the race continues, with no other remedial changes. Organisers claim that the final result is fair. But it's clearly dishonest. It's clearly willful ignorance. Colour blindness is just like this example. For one thing, it ignores intergenerational advantages for white people and the corresponding disadvantages for others. Imagine that the race was a relay. Some of the first leg runners are given the stone in the shoe treatment. The effect ripples through each following runner in each team, and it shows at the finish line. Advantages and disadvantages continue to accumulate. Colour blindness is a fanciful superhero power anyway, and if you don't believe me, then try the online self-test that you can see on your screen now. Colour blindness persuades white people that they're not part of the problem, and so need change nothing. It's another brand of racism, and the media loves to push it. And let's be honest here, colonialism was not a stone in a shoe and neither is neocolonialism. They're more like millstones around the neck. Double standards are a big enough problem in themselves, but when they're mixed up with conditioning and silence, then they become even more of a menace. The case around Mark Duggan is a good example. The many police statements and retractions around the gun issue are farcical, especially those about Duggan shooting at and hitting an officer. This was later pulled because the bullet in question was found to have come from a police weapon. You'd know if you were hit, regardless of if you were wearing a vest. If a black person behaved in this way, they'd be called an unreliable witness, incompetent, or simply a barefaced liar. And what about the recent cases of, of the Roma being persecuted by having their children taken from them? The story went global, but not when the children were returned. What I saw was guilty until proven innocent. Where are all the white people who've had their non-white children snatched by the authorities because the analysis of the ignorant is sufficient to stimulate bigoted interventions? And then there's the case of Woolwich and Birmingham. I've already dealt with this, but a reminder is fitting. Somewhere deep inside, we know the value of a free press is in its capacity as a checks and balances tool. But where on earth is the media commentary on these blatant double standards? There's also cultural racism, which is about association and generalisation. Some of the media's coverage of certain countries or peoples is repeated so often that they form strong and instant one-dimensional associations. What's your thoughts? Somalia, Rwanda, Sudan, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Libya. Race itself need never be mentioned. We join the dots to paint a picture of barbarism, helplessness and ineptitude for an entire continent or race. Let's remember some people here. Patrice Lumamba, Prime Minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thomas Sankara, President of Burkina Faso. Kwame Nkrumah, President of Ghana. And Nelson Mandela, described by Margaret Thatcher as that grubby little terrorist. 
All of these people were utterly misrepresented in the Western media. Sometimes misrepresentation isn't required. You can just ignore a story. And then there's the big story of now, AFRICOM. The mass media isn't reporting on AFRICOM. That's how the USA, NATO and the IMF are working together militarily in African nations. It's all about resources, neocolonialism. Conservative estimates like John Pilger say 35 African nations are being invaded. Others put the figure as high as 49. Another Chris Jammy quote, When we think we're automatically entitled to something, that's when we start walking all over others to get it. The mass media also does cultural aggression, sometimes by the carrot, sometimes by the stick. For example then, some media stories hide aggression in what initially appears to be a positive story, e.g. immigrants and BMEs getting approval for blending in with the dominant culture. Scratch the surface though, and it's still pressure to drop their culture, drop their heritage, etc. Pressure by the carrot rather than the stick is still pressure, it's still cultural aggression, it's still racism as white supremacy. I've been pretty focused on the so-called factual media, but let's have a quick look at fiction and the relentless stereotyping therein. For example then, the portrayal of non-white characters in Hollywood films. Black characters are consistently baddies, they die early, they're there for the body count, or they die nobly saving white characters. All Arnold Schwarzenegger films do this. This website lists tens of Hollywood films going back decades with analysis of black characters and their roles. Of course, the media doesn't only deal in words and moving images. It also deals in stills, e.g. adverts. Here's a number of recent examples that were sometimes full for racism, but sometimes not. Here's some associations to look out for. Black people portrayed as less than human, primitive, animal, demonic, uncivilized. White people as superior with black people's subservience, worship or subordination. Also look out for plain and simple whitewashing. And look out for associations of ugliness. This one speaks for itself. As does this one. Sometimes a word is used to hammer home the message. Back to the obvious again. And this is Nivea, letting us know precisely what it thinks natural African hair represents. Looks like worship, and it's also clearly saying the leaders have the brains and the followers have the brawn. Their function is reduced to the physical. This is a before and after shot selling a beauty product. These consistently push whiteness as the standard. In this case, paler skin, straight hair. And another before and after, not even using the same person. The white towels help to contrast skin tones and hair colour, though you don't get any help with the hairstyles. And this is whitewashing. Watch the black man in the middle disappear. Ford in the UK did exactly the same thing. And while I can find the story in the media, I can't find the images. Lucky for Ford, hey? No explanation needed. The impact of the media, especially concerning stories or images that go viral, is different for different people. However, anti-racism researchers have advice, especially for white middle-class people. White middle-class people are usually the most secure and most privileged, so we're not usually the best judge of how these kinds of images will impact on the lived realities for minoritized groups. It doesn't matter how many degrees we have, or how absolutely passionate we are about civil liberty. White privileged folk aren't the only people to have insight into these issues. And in many ways, there are aspects of these debates that we cannot know. We have to listen to other people and their experiences if we're serious. Let's wrap up this part, the role of miseducation and the mass media. Education hides and or whitewashes history in the process stereotyping. The mass media does the same, but also does a whole lot more, hiding causality pushing poor definitions, shutting down discussion, censorship, double standards, direct stereotyping, offering misleading remedies, staying silent when outrage is appropriate, cultural racism, cultural aggression, hiding the big geopolitical stories, and a whole lot more.